Handheld video is notorious for being shaky, sometimes so shaky that it distracts viewers from your message. Or sometimes you might have a point of view shot where the camera's on a moving object like a shopping cart or an automobile or a go-kart, and it's bouncing around a little bit, and that too can be distracting. So you might want to stabilize those kinds of shots. Well, After Effects offers two ways to stabilize shaky video. One's built into the tracker panel, and the other one's a separate effect called the Warp Stabilizer. We're going to work with both of them in this lesson. So to follow along, go to Working Files, After Effects Projects, and open up 1604 Stabilize. What I've done here is created a simulated handheld video clip. I took this street scene and applied the wiggle expression to the position and to the rotation so that it kind of bounces around a bit like this. And when it bounces around like that and changes position, it then shows the edges of the clip. And so I had to expand the scale to 105% so that it didn't go inside the frame. Now that I've done this, I want to stabilize this footage. But the Warp Stabilizer ignores these effects. So I need to nest this inside another composition. So I'm going to go to this composition, which is empty. And then I want you to take the street scene pre-comp and nest it in there like that. And now you're going to see that this is looking like a handheld shot like that. Now we're going to take two methods to stabilize this. We're going to start off with the tracker. I've got the tracker panel open over here. If you don't have the tracker panel open, go to Window and Tracker. Open it up. And down here you see we've got these four buttons. These top two are effects, and we're going to work with the warp stabilizer in a moment. This bottom one says Stabilize Motion, and that's the one we're going to use here. It's built into the tracker. Now you could access Stabilize Motion the old-fashioned way. You could click on Track Motion, then you go down to Track Type, and then say Stabilize. That's the way it used to be done. But now this button simplifies this process. So I'm going to do Control or Command Z to undo that because I added a tracker in the process there. Now I'm going to click on Stabilize Motion. And it's going to add the tracker. And it's going to say Stabilize. And it says Position. Now in this case, we need to worry about rotation as well because the camera not only kind of shakes around, it also rotates a bit. So I'm going to add rotation. And that's going to add a second tracker. Now if I had been shooting this, let's say, as a trucking shot where the camera itself is moving quite a bit instead of just a little bit with a handheld motion, or it had been a point of view shot, I would not click on position because the camera's moving around and I really can't focus on position to try to stabilize the shot. In that case, I would click on rotation and scale. But in this case, we're doing position and rotation to settle the camera down. So now we need to find two things in the shot that shouldn't move. We've got a lot of people walking through the shot. They don't qualify. We need to find something that's supposed to be stable. So let me zoom in on the shot a little bit by doing Control or Command Plus a couple times. There you go. Let's find something here. I like that light. That's perfect because it's bright. It has a lot of contrast. So I'm going to move that guy up to here. Just take this first track point and drag it up there to that light. There we go. I think that'll work out pretty well. Let me expand the view a little bit there to make sure I can find it. I think we got it. Okay, let's get something else here. I'm thinking this little bright thing over here might work as well. So I'm going to drag this one over there. There we go. I'm setting this up knowing that, in fact, it's going to be a little bit of a problem because the head of the bicycle rider is going to cut this off. But I'm going to show you how to deal with that in a moment as that happens. So I'm going to do Shift forward slash just to kind of see this again. I think we're now ready to go. We've got all of our points set up, and we're here at the beginning of the clip. If I had set this up in the middle, it still would have been okay. We could analyze backward and then analyze forward as well. But we're going to analyze forward from there and see how this goes. It's tracking things pretty well. Let's see what happens when the bicyclist gets in front of that little sign, though. Going to create a problemo right about there. OK, we're going to fix that now. So let me just go back and zoom in a bit on the screen again. And we're going to take care of these keyframes in a moment. But first of all, I get the tracker back in the right position. So I'm going to move this around a bit. And I want to pull it back to the moment that thing is visible, which is right about there. You can't tell with all the tracker points there, but now we'll be able to see it when I pull this thing down. One more notch here. There you go. Now I can see this with a little four arrow headed thing there. Go down here to that light again. There you go. We'll track forward from this point now, knowing that these keyframes are all bad. Let's go forward here. There we go. Now it's following it well again. Right to the end of the clip. Good. Now we need to get rid of those keyframes there that will throw this off. So I'm going to go down here to the layer and press U to see all those keyframes. This is track point two. So we're going to go down to track point two here. I need to go to the place where the keyframe is good, right there, and then it's going to pop off at some point, right where the head comes out of the screen. Right about there is the bad one. And here's the good one. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to delete all the keyframes in between the bad one and the good one. 
And rather than show you the whole process there, I think you know how to do that. You just kind of identify both ends of there and just highlight those keyframes and then delete them. So I'm going to fast forward to the end of that process. Goes from there to there. It'd be a slight little bump there, but I think we can live with that for our purposes. Now this is all done here. We'll zoom back out full here. I'm going to take this thing back to zoom out full by shift forward slash. And now we're going to apply it. We don't need to edit the target because the target is always the thing we just analyzed. So the target by default is the pre comp there. So now we just click on apply. We say, oh yeah, X and Y, good. And let's see what happened here. Let's just watch this. Okay, now you notice we've got all this stuff around the edge here. That's because the way this thing works is it tries to find something in the screen and hold it steady. So it needs to move the clip in the opposite direction of any motion that it sees. So what I'm seeing here is a rock steady shot. It looks great, but we need to adjust the scale now to compensate for the fact that it had to move the clip around within the frame. So what I need to do now is deal with the fact that we've got these gaps here. So let me close down all these little keyframes to kind of simplify things. I'm gonna go on here and I'm gonna click S for scale. Let's just look for the place where the scale kind of is at its worst there. That's kind of where the gap is largest. So I'll take the scale up a little bit. I'll hold on the control or command key to make it gradual. There you go. I think that's going to take care of it. Let's see what we have now. Kind of go through there and see if I see any gaps as I just scrub up. Oh, there's another gap there. Right there, I need to increase the scale a little bit more to compensate for that. So I could adjust the position here. The keyframes that we've got here apply to the anchor point and rotation. They don't apply to position. So I could adjust the position a little bit here to compensate for this, and it's just a one-time thing. I don't need to keyframe it across the entire clip. So let's just take a look at that. I go P for position. You can see it's keyframe. They turn on keyframes for it, but it really isn't necessary. And they do put a keyframe there by default. But I think what I'd rather do is just go in here a little ways to where that thing drops down. And I see now that overall the position can be shifted a little bit north here. So I'm going to turn off the keyframe there. And now I'm going to just make it go a little bit higher up there, just a little bit like that. No need to keyframe it. I think now we've taken care of the fact that we had to scale it a bit, and that does take care of the whole thing. Now it's going to be steady. If I turn off this border, you won't notice the fact that it's shifting around a lot. So let's just take a look now. Now you see that it's a pretty much rock steady shot. So there's an example of how effective the tracker can be. It does create these absolutely rock steady shots if you can find a couple of things in the scene where they are supposed to be stable. Let's try this again now with the warp stabilizer. So I'm going to bring down the pre-comp again to this comp. There you go. I'm going to turn off the one in the background just in case. We're going to work on this one now. I'm going to use the warp stabilizer. Now, there are just tons of ways to load up the warp stabilizer effect. It is an effect. So if you go to effects and presets, type in warp like that. There it is. You just double click and bring it in there. Also, of course, can click on this and go to effect and to distort. There's the warp stabilizer way down at the bottom. In any event, there are several ways, even more than what I just showed you. We'll just click on the Warp Stabilizer button here, and that's going to add the Warp Stabilizer to that clip, and it's going to immediately start analyzing the clip. And this can take quite a while. It'll take longer than the Stabilize Motion option inside the tracker takes. And it's looking for things inside the clip. It's finding things on its own that should be stable, and then essentially marking them. And once it does that, once it marks those things, then it stabilizes the clip based on these settings that you've got here. These are the default settings. I'm going to show you how you can change those settings in a bit. So we're going to let this thing go for the two minutes that it's got left to analyze this clip. And when it's done, it'll come back. All right, it's close to wrapping up the analysis. And what's going to happen now is that it's going to stabilize the clip. And it's stabilizing based on these settings. Now, the thing is, the analysis information is kept inside the project file. You can always change the stabilizing, and that just uses the analysis to then update the stabilizing. So what we have here is smooth motion. Smooth motion then tries to have the little bit of camera motion left. It doesn't try to lock it down the way the stabilized motion option does in the tracker. So you see how the camera still kind of moves around a little bit there? And the fact that it moves around a little bit means that you crop out less of the edges there. If you change this from smooth motion to no motion, that means it's going to be just like the stabilized motion over here. But no motion crops more to compensate for the fact that it's not smooth. When you use the smooth motion option, it's actually trying to avoid cropping as much as it can. And smooth motion is probably your best bet. It's not that much motion, relatively speaking. It shows a little bit of the sort of handheld motion, but not much as you go through there. Nevertheless, that's your choice. As far as the smoothness amount goes, 
the lower amount is more or less equal to the original footage, the higher amount then crops some more as it tries to sort of overcome the motion there. The method that it used to do smoothness is called subspace warp. That's the default. And what it does is it tries to compensate for the motion by actually warping parts of the image, and that can be a real problem. If you see curved lines that should be straight, something like that. In this case, it's not bad, but if this thing were, let's say, a little bit more motion in it, it might actually twist things around into a way that you don't want to do that. So then you can back off. And position, scale, and rotation is probably your safest bet because it compensates for, you know, the shaky camera and also the rotation, that kind of stuff. So it's probably good to use that one if warp things look really weird. Under borders, you've got a framing choice, and stabilize, crop, and auto scale is your best bet. Not only does it stabilize it, but also crops it to make sure you've got everything smooth on the inside, and it auto scales to make sure that you don't have any blank areas as we did on the other one. Stabilize synthesize edges actually looks in front of or behind frames to try to fill in gaps around the edge, and that can create some real oddities. Like you might get these pillars here and they're shifted over a little bit because of the camera motion. So this one is probably your best bet, but you might want to try synthesize edges and see what that does. It does give you a little bit more space around the edges there. So that's basically how Warp Stabilizer works. I like both of them, depending. I like to use the stabilized motion to just lock things down. It's a fast way to do it. It works faster than Warp Stabilizer. And I like the Warp Stabilizer because it kind of smooths out handheld shots without making them rock steady. I mean, really, it's your pick depending on the kind of video that you're making.